Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening for another very special edition of Wow's Alive. We're here with Joe from Scottsdale, Arizona. Do I have that right? Yes, Joe Zemitis. Nice to nice to yeah. get a chance to talk yeah. to you. And Joe, I mean, I look at your career and you've done like everything. Ice miles, channel swims in Hawaii. Sort of give us an overview of, of your career. Uh, well, I guess my guiding principle is that I do stuff that sounds fun and challenging. Um, you know, I think back to how it all started and, and it, was, it was interesting. I don't give this a lot of thought. I usually just kind of push forward in the future, but you know, in preparation for the talk with you, I kind of thought back, I was like, where did it all start? I guess the origin story for um, open water, it really goes, I, I mean, I raced, um, I, I swam through high school and college and I raced triathlon at a high level. I actually did my first Ironman in Hawaii when I was 18, okay. 10 hours there in 98. Uh, race triathlon at a um, amateur elite and, and professional level for a couple of years. Um, and then as I started my swim team, Swim Neptune, and that grew, got to the point where, I mean, there's a lot of things you can fake your way through in life, but an Ironman's not one of them. Yeah. And uh, I just couldn't do both 100%. So, yeah. uh, so my personal athletic pursuits went on the back burner as I really uh, launched my coaching career and my swim team. Um, in 2006, I kind of got drawn back into open water as I worked with a kid, uh, Braxton Bilbrey, who was uh, seven the first time he swam Alcatraz. Okay. Uh, and the next year when he was eight, we went back and did um, around Alcatraz, Strider Aquatic Park out around Alcatraz and back when he was eight. Just one of those, you know, real unusual kids that just ate it up and, and just loved, loved doing it. Um, and then uh, started a open water swim program with, uh, with the kids mostly on our on swim Neptune, but clubs across the valley where we would swim Alcatraz and then across the Golden Gate each year, each year in April. So now that we're 14 years into that, um, minus this year, it got uh, pandemic out in 2020, but we'll be back uh, with 100 plus kids in 2021. Really? Um, oh, wow. And so just over the years, I mean, just watching hundreds, probably closing in on a thousand kids um, from Arizona introduced to open water swimming through our programs. Uh, so it's always kind of been on... Uh, back there, but I, you know, it was always just, you know, kind of a fun weekend thing. We would do some training um, in Bartlett Lake over the winter, the kids would all be wetsuits and get down to 50 degrees, 55 degrees, you know, that challenge, the mental challenge of that, just really fun to watch uh, kids really uh, get drawn to that open water. And a lot of the really cool thing as a coach is a lot of times the kids that really were passionate and successful in open water weren't those kids that were super successful in the pool. Right, they were kind of middle of the pack or back of the pack pool swimmers, but man, you put them in open water and they could go forever and really find something in swimming that they could be great at. Yeah. Um, so that was always, you know, so it always kind of, you know, for the last 14 years running that uh, swim every year, Bob Roper, um, the okay. late great Bob Roper was yeah. uh, just a driving force and helping us put that together every year. And, um, you know, it's just something we continue to see. And, um, so that's kind of the backstory. And then where I really got into the channel swimming, I think came across a, a list of Ocean 7 swims yeah. uh, one time online. And so thank you for that. Uh, yeah. I was looking through that and, and I kind of recall looking at being like, that's crazy, I could never do that. No, nope, I couldn't do that. Couldn't do that. Sounds too hard, sounds too cold. Strait of Gibraltar. That sounds like English Channel light, half the distance and 10 <laughs> degrees warmer. Yeah. So that, I think I can do that. So I kind of created this little like reunion of guys I swam with in high school. Okay. Um, and there were like five or six of us that went over there and hung out in the south of Spain for a week waiting for a good day to swim the Strait of Gibraltar and reconnected oh, with some friends that we, you know, from high school. And it was just a great experience. Um, yeah. So that was that was the first one for me was Strait of Gibraltar because it sounded like something I could do. Got it. Got it. I, I want to go back. You, Swim Neptune is a great club. It's very successful. You've been inspirational to a lot of, a lot of swimmers. Were you always driven to be a coach? Or did, did you have that in mind or is it something you fell into? Um, I think I always had it in mind. Um, I, I started swimming uh, summer league in, in Virginia with the Brookfield Breakers and, and just remember how much fun summer swimming was. So the whole idea when I started so Neptune, right after I graduated in college, is try to bring that fun and excitement of a summer team to a year-round competitive level. Because even when I advanced kind of through the competitive side, um, you know, it just seemed like a lot of times it was like 
less fun and more <laughs> work. And, uh, you know, it's like, you, it doesn't have to be one or the other. I mean, you yeah. can, you know, swim well and, and have a lot of fun doing it. So um, that's kind of, you know, when I was trying to, when I graduated from college, started uh, trying to qualify to race triathlon professionally. So starting the swim team was a way to kind of create a job for myself and Got control it. the schedule and be able to, you know, have a weekend off if I wanted to go race or build the practice schedule around my training schedule. So it started small, me and 15 kids at one pool. And now we're at eight pools across the uh, valley, um, across the Phoenix, Arizona area with the staff of about 25 coaches and wow. uh, pandemic numbers, you know, if it's fluctuates hard to say, but, you know, typically we'll see seven to 800 kids through the program. In wow, the outstanding. And what was funny is, you know, I'm from California, so we understand the Southwest desert of of america you know basically yeah. from la all the way through texas it's a lot of desert um, sure but yet you named your team swim neptune <laughs> neptune of all things i mean i wouldn't associate neptune with the desert but somehow you did yeah um that was that was deliberate i kind of went with neptune because i was looking for the um I mean, just that that C personified and, and a name that would work anywhere. Um, yeah. Even though we started in Phoenix, I had a vision that went beyond just like one city. So I didn't want to name it after a city or I, you know, at some point I was thinking possibly going to dental school or something. You know, like if I moved, I, you could do swim Neptune anywhere. It wasn't geographically yeah. tied. Got it. Um, so it was just more that, you know, there's that C personified in yeah. Roman mythology, you know, and, right. and uh you know, just that was that was why the name came about. And it's really worked out well because I wasn't thinking open water at that point. But that's uh, really been a, a good mix. Yeah. And then I, I also want to go back. You know, you sort of skipped over the triathlon side and you did say you were elite and professional, but you were really good. You were really, <laughs> really good. I mean, the triathletes uh, in the audience, they don't know if you're doing a sub 10 for an Ironman triathlon, you know, in Javi, where you're cycling out in the sure. against the lava fields, et cetera. That's fast. That's really fast. So, I mean, in in the you know suffering through an Ironman triathlon, you did some in Malaysia. You, you obviously did Hawaii. Um, how does that compare? That sort of discomfort of extreme triathlon racing versus a channel swim, a marathon swim, an ice swim. Yeah, they're very, they're very different. Um, you know, I think Ironman, it was really, uh, that was kind of my obsession uh, really growing up. I mean, I had a goal when I was 12 to do Ironman Hawaii at the youngest age you could do it. Okay. So I had my eye on Ironman 98 for a long time. And uh, just to the number of things, I mean, that's a story for another day, but the, the, yeah. the things that had to happen to make that work and then, you know, having, getting a spot at the starting line and then having a goal of going under 10 hours and um, realizing the week before that the fastest 19 and under time it was 9.59. Uh, so I was like, well, as long as I'm going under 10, I may as well pick up that course record in the meantime, uh, go 9.57 to be just right on that edge. Um, right. You know, that was uh, really, a, really a dream come true. And, and I even remember when I was 12, thinking back that if I can do the hardest race in the world at the youngest age, they'll let you, I can do anything. And, um, you know, that's kind of been this ethos that's that's kind of carried me forward. Um, you know, it's funny because I'll read on the triathlon message boards and people say, oh, the English channel's way harder than Ironman. I, I, I don't know that I'd say that. It's different and it's a lot colder, um, yeah. but redlining for 10 hours at an Ironman is harder than just settling into a pace and channel swimming for, yeah. for 12 hours in the English channel. I mean, I definitely put racing at, at Kona or um, at the Ironman Malaysia, I did that three times. I think um, those were those are harder than the English Channel just because you're you're redlining for ten hours. The English right. Channel is just more about um, adapting to the conditions and and acclimating to the cold and just kind of grinding it out. I'm not yeah. redlining in the Channel. Right, and I've been to Kona. I've seen the Ironman, and and the start of the race is just it's a zoo, and that's like being oh, yeah. polite. <laughs> I mean, how was it being, you know, among the elite and just, you know, I know they've got, you know, what is it, 2,100 or however many starters they have. Right. And yes, there are people who hang back, but I mean, that first thousand, I mean, it's as competitive as, as anything I've seen. 
Yeah, it was, um, it was awesome though. I was, uh, again, swimming was my background. As far as triathlon go, I was definitely an elite swimmer. I believe I was 18th out of the water okay. uh, that year at Kona. I was a 50, I think 50, 30 coming out of the water. So okay. it was, you know, amazing seeing guys, you know, the pros pass me on the bike. I'm like, whoa, that's Peter Reed. Like I was ahead of him, you know, like it was, <laughs> you know, they passed me on the bike, like I was standing still, but, uh, you know, just, uh, be in the front of that race um, was was fun, and I always just enjoyed that kind of swimming as a contact sport atmosphere of the start of a try. Um, yeah, you know, so yeah. that was really kind of a great introduction to that open water feel. Great, and then so you you finish um, straight at Gibraltar with your with your high school yeah. buddies, and yes. then what was the next sort of iteration of uh, Joe well, Marathon? I mean, yeah, the next iteration really launched the whole swimming thing. And that was Scar. That okay. was Scar in Arizona, which which still is just one of my favorite places to be. And uh, just Kent does a great, Kent Nicholas does a great yeah. job with that swim. And um, to me, that that was transformational because I really love stage swims because stage swims really gives you a chance to meet and interact with other people. Yeah. Right. So those swims, uh, my brother and I, we're, we're off on our own a lot. Even with one day races, you don't really get a chance to really right. talk to anybody or meet them, but Scar, you're seeing the same people uh, for four days in a row. And yeah. you start hearing about what they've done. And I, you know, I went into that thinking, oh, the English channel, that's something I could never do until I met some channel swimmers and talked to them. And I'm like, well, I think I could do that. You know, um, you know, and just, just hearing, learning kind of the tricks of the trade, right? I mean, that's all stuff we learned at Scar, um, you know, the magic of Carbo Pro, the, uh, why, you know, if you don't want to, like, sunblock's not going to work, so you need balm X or desitin, or, you know, and, and baby oil, that's going to take that off right away. I mean, that's all stuff we've learned at, at stage swims and kind of built our body of knowledge. Um, so it was really Scar that, that opened our eyes. Um, and then with my brother's uh, work schedule uh, and, and ability to travel, we just enjoyed traveling, too. So we're like, let's find a swim in a cool place and then travel around afterwards. So then yeah. after SCAR, we did um, Lake Zurich uh, okay. in Switzerland. And, and that was just a just a beautiful, a beautiful swim. Great location. Traveled around for a week or so after there, that and was like, man, you know, we could kind of get used to this. And, yeah. and it was really, you know, really was SCAR, though, because it was talking to other people and finding out like the cool swims to do and um, just built confidence knowing like I just swam with these people for four days. They told me I can do English Channel. They're probably right. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's great. Well, I want to now dial forward to your latest swim, which was 40 bridges. Yes. I mean, 40 bridges twice around Manhattan Island. I mean, that's once around is a monster twice around. Uh, it's just incredible. And Remarkably, there was three guys in that race and you all finished what, a few minutes apart? Yeah, we all finished within about a minute of each other. <laughs> it was great. I was uh, Jim, a uh, great guy from uh, Maryland that I was racing there at the end. It, it, the two of us finished real close and then um, John dropped back a little bit at the end. But since John and I signed up, at, start, uh, signed up as tandem, they gave me John's time as well. So Got it. it was uh, even a little closer than the times. Uh, oh, okay. Show. Can you, can you describe that race? Uh, you know, it, it was, it's, again, it's more of an event than a race. Um, you know, it was, it was, uh, I, I, the reason, what drew me to it is I'd done 20 bridges. I'd done it on two separate occasions and just really loved that swim. And the thought of swimming around New York at night was the reason I wanted to do 40 okay. bridges, was to get, just to see the city lit up and, and to spend, you know, the, to swim, you know, a second loop. That's, that's why I really wanted to do that swim. So, um, you know, it got off to a rough start because um, we were a little late getting started and, and had to actually, um, about three hours in, the current shifted earlier than expected. So we had to get pulled and restart at Mill Rock. So we actually got 44 bridges in that day. No way. Um, really? Yeah, yeah. So it was actually, you know, we were in the water three hours longer than the time shows because we got repositioned after uh, three hours and about six or seven miles. Um, oh, wait a second. Wait a second. Now this, this is mind blowing. So yeah. you're mentally locked in to go 91 kilometers or twice around yeah. Manhattan. You're swimming for three hours and then suddenly someone said, stop, stop, stop. Just kidding. We're going to start again. Yeah, well, yes. It was funny because going into it, um, like Rondi and Dave are just so great at planning those swims and just 
just so precise and everything. So we knew there were two options, either a Pier A start at nine or a Mill Rock start at noon and some back and forth with, with John and I and, and Jim, we all kind of, you know, decided to start at Pier A at nine. Okay. And then as we, our progress was slowing and you could feel the current getting stronger, I felt like I was, okay. you know, in Alice in Wonderland where you have to run as fast as you can just to stay in place, right? Oh, wow. And then it's just like, you know, so in the back of my mind, I'm like, this isn't gonna work. I wonder if we can like restart at Mill Rock at, no at noon. And like a couple minutes later, they were telling us to stop and get in the boat. And <laughs> Abby Fairman was on the boat. She's like, well, there is a plan B. I'm like, Mill Rock start at noon, right? And she's like, yeah, we can make that. It's like, let's do it. So oh, wow. it's funny towards the end of, as the current was shifting, I'd kind of come to that conclusion on my own. I'm like, man, we need to, we need to try again. We get 44 bridges for the price of 40, 10% free. Well, that is definitely the longest warm up for yeah. <laughs> a marathon swim I've ever heard of. Well, and that was the funny thing about it too, with uh, Jim and John and myself were on the boat. I mean, we were still in pretty good spirits. I mean, it was just like, yeah, we're all warmed up. Let's start this thing for real. <laughs> okay, so so you're going around, you know, you're, you're in this race and it, I mean, you, are you guys are going for it toward the end? just trying to beat each other? Uh, sort of, I mean, just towards the, like really it was the last half mile or so. Okay. Uh, we, I didn't, we didn't see Jim a lot. I mean, John and I were swimming tandem, so we were next to each other the whole time. Uh, but just the way those currents play out, you know, he kind of came right up on us towards the end. And it was, it was you know, fun. It was, it was a chance to be like, man, we're, we've been in the water now for, you know, 22 plus hours. Like, I wonder what I've got. Like, it wasn't, <laughs> wasn't about really wanting to win the race. I was just wanted to test myself of like, where, where am I going to be after 22 hours? What do I have in the tank? So just learning more about myself and how far you could push that and what kind of speed I could get after, you know, being awake for 26, 27 hours, you know, it was just, just learning something new. It was great. Great. Yeah. Great this is funny listening to you, a coach, talk to yourself as an athlete. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of that internal dialogue because you look at those times in the water and what else are you going to do? That's a lot of, uh, it's a lot of time in the water. Yeah. What, what do you think about when you, when you do these long swims? You know, um, nothing in particular, uh, oh, kind of a key for me is, is counting strokes. Uh, that's a way to keep my, my mind occupied and, and to just, uh, I, that's something I did in Gibraltar. That's something I did in the very first time because it's funny, I jump in and, um, there's a, we're a, we're supposed to be two different tandem swims, but ended up all seven of us starting at once because we only had one good day of weather. Uh -huh. And, you know, so it's a little chaotic with all seven of us trying to find a pace where we can swim together. And, you know, that water seemed cold. It was probably high 60s. But at the time, I was like, oh, it's cold water. Like everything was kind of chaotic. And after a while, I'm like, OK, I bet it's been at least 30 or 45 minutes. So I look at my watch and it's been seven minutes. <laughs> it's like, OK, this is, this is not going to work. I'm not going to look at my watch again until I've taken a thousand strokes with my right arm. Okay. And I did that. And then that took like about 32, 33 minutes. And I was like, oh man, that made the time pass. And it yeah. just helps me keep a good cadence and rhythm. So, you know, if uh, out in the middle of a swim, I'll just count out a thousand strokes or count out 2,500 strokes and that'll pass a half hour, an hour or so. Got it. Got it. So, so you've done, you know, the channel, some of the channels of, of the Ocean 7, straight to Gibraltar, yes. English Two to channel. go, yeah. Yeah. And uh, you, you've also, when you did uh, Catalina, you completed yes. the uh, triple crown of open water swimming. Correct. Again, a few hundred people have done it, but you did some, you, you created something new. Triple yes. Triple crown of stage swimming. That's right. Can you, um, can you explain that to the audience? Yeah. Yeah. Triple crown of stage swims is a concept uh, developed uh, combining three of the great, uh, what I consider the great stage swims in the country. And, and uh, like I said, earlier, I, I love stage swims because it's got that social aspect to it and that, um, and kind of that, that daily grind. It's not about just being great on one day. It's being able to do it, get up and do it again tomorrow. And to, to finish, you know, a stage swim or finish eight bridges, you got to have seven good days. If you have six good days, that's not enough. You yeah. got to start over if you don't finish stage five, you know? Yeah. Um, so it's, it's that, it's a different type of challenge where, you know, rewards the swimmer that can not only swim strong and have a good day, but you got to get up and do it again tomorrow. So my concept was, you know, creating a triple crown that combines uh, the eight bridges swim in New York, which is 127 miles or 120 miles in seven stages 
down the Hudson. So river swim on the East Coast. Got Scar, which is about 40-ish miles, four lakes, four days in Arizona. And a, Steve that, a swim that Steve and Alia uh, put together in Hawaii, that's uh, the kind of the Hawaii Triangle. It's the three swims from, uh, it goes from Maui to Lanai, Lanai to Molokai, and Molokai to Maui on yeah. three different days. So three very different swims, right? You got an ocean, you got a river, you got a lake, and you've got kind of East Coast, the West, and the island. So uh, it ends up being, what is that, 14 days? So uh, two weeks of swimming and, and somewhere is around 180, 190 miles. Yeah, no, it, it, it's a great concept and I'm glad to see that uh, other people are, are doing it. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, it, how old are you now? You're 30 late. I uh, just turned 40. Oh, you just turned 40. Okay. Yeah. So looking back at your career, what would you have told yourself at the age of 12 or the age of 18, um, knowing what you know now, but with similar goals? Oh, uh, I go that far back. I mean, it's, it's, you know, just about how swimming and this is about triathlon as well as sports that you can do for a lifetime. You know, and, and to be, you know, still kind of on the younger end of marathon swimming, yeah. you know, that to gotta have a lot of years ahead of me. And, you know, that's what, you know, even the kids that do Alcatraz with us say, you know, this is something you can do for your whole life. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and to always have those next goals that, um, you know, you want to be successful in the here and now and you get, get all keyed up on the next race or the next event, but realize, you know, there's always next year and there's always another swim. And it's something you can keep going with and do for a lifetime. Yeah. Um, so I've always been into that, you know, kind of having those, those big goals. I mean, starting with, with Ironman, but now continuing, uh, you know, kind of next up is just knocking off those next two on the last two on the ocean seven and getting enough travel restrictions loose to, to go to Japan and, and uh, New Zealand, but that'll happen when it happens. Yeah. Yeah. And then what um, other than ocean seven um, do you, do you plan your next schedule all the time with your brother or, you know, it, how do you plan out? out? Cause it's not well, only you, it's your brother too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and that's the thing. I mean, you should talk to him sometime. He's uh, he's got a great, you know, he's done pretty much all the same swims I've done. Um, you know, we just, you know, there is no like big overall plan and a lot of the stuff, a lot of the swims I've done this year have come kind of last minute. Um, you know, it's stuff that's easy to get to for us. We've been to California a bunch, um, you know, easier travel. Uh, the first two swims I did this summer, Santa Barbara and, and Tahoe with, with a, um, a kid that's uh, 17 uh, in Phoenix, that Henry Palmer that uh, has really gotten, you know, one of those Alcatraz kids that's really kind of gotten more into open water and had a great swim in Santa Barbara. And so we kind of planned those out. He was trying to go for that California triple crown until they canceled all of Catalina. So that took the wind out of that sails a little bit for this year. Um, and then, you know, the rest of it was just, you know, with John being home now and not going back to Nigeria, we just had a little bit win bigger window of time. So that's when we got the 40 bridges done, did the round trip Angel Island, and then, um, went back to, uh, to do Monterey Bay last week. That was, uh, he, he was the first man to do it. We tried a tandem in June of last year and um, he finished and I got pulled about a mile out. Uh, uh, hypothermia and, or yeah, jellyfish? Yeah, uh, mostly hypothermia. I don't remember, it's a little foggy. <laughs> <laughs> the end there is quite a bit foggy, but uh, had to kind of go back and slay the dragon and that's, uh, it's what I did last week with, with Monterey. So, oh, how, you know, there how, hasn't I, been this big plan. It's just been what sounds like fun and knocking these down. Got it. What was, what was your time across Monterey? Monterey was 1329. So okay. just got under 13 and a half. And how was it? It was really tough. Um, yeah. Water was hovering around 56 the whole time. I mean, okay. just thousands and thousands and thousands of jellyfish. Fortunately, they were about three feet deep. So it didn't get stung as much as I otherwise could have. It was the upside down jellyfish that had the spiky side pointed up. Got that it. was the problem. <laughs> Swimming over the bells of them wasn't as much of an issue. Uh, but that's one. Uh, but it was it was probably one of the hardest swims I've done because it was 13 and a half miles of or 13 and a half hours of you know cold water and, and jellyfish. And the trouble with jellyfish is you can never really relax. You can yeah. never relax and tune out. You always have to be hyper aware of 
what's around you so you don't swim face first into a into one of them yeah do you have any upcoming swims for the rest of the balance of this year uh just some ideas i'm kicking around nothing um specific yet but okay. uh you know trying to you know just see what what we can do i mean we're starting to transfer my focus more into the um the coaching side of things okay. with uh doing some lake sw training swims for our alcatraz we always usually start those in november so the kids are swimming in the lakes in Arizona get down to the low 50s to mid 50s, okay. which is okay. exactly what they need to to experience to be ready to swim uh, strong in the San Francisco Bay in April. So, yeah. you know, focused on that. We'd love to get some uh, Southern Hemisphere swims in, but, uh, you know, I, I just don't know when, yeah. when the whole travel thing is going to get back to normal a little bit. Yeah. Uh, last question, but um, and this is probably a hard one because you've done so many swims. Yeah. Where's your favorite place to swim? Uh, I'd say it was funny because I was looking down the list and there isn't one swim on there that I was like, man, I wish I hadn't done that. Like that's one I wouldn't recommend to people. There isn't one of those swims. They've all uh, been something I've enjoyed. Um, the two I'd say that are the most memorable uh, was Loch Ness um, and the Sea of Galilee. Oh, okay. Uh, mostly, you know, because part of like what you said, your favorite place to go, because at some level, you know, swims kind of bleed together and, and you know, swimming, swimming, you know, like yeah. as, you know, you've got temperature, you've got like weather conditions, you've got surface chop and stuff. But, you know, if those things kind of even out, like swims kind of are the same all over the world. But yeah. being in Scotland was a lot of fun. That Loch Ness is in a beautiful area. And then doing the Sea of Galilee uh, last November, we did a, a two-way crossing and it was, I mean, just the history in that area and spending a couple of days in, in Jerusalem afterwards. And it was just um, just a super trip and a really, really great swim. Um, sea of Galilee was great. It, I mean, the very, very different swims, Loch Ness is mid fifties, Galilee was like mid seventies. So <laughs> very, very different, Yeah, uh, but both very memorable and a lot of fun. Yeah. Now there's an increasing number of Americans who are going over to Israel for, for a variety of um, uh, swims. Uh, who are the group of people that you, you teamed up to escort you, observe you, ratify over in Israel? Uh, well, I think that uh, Guy Cohen is really the guy to talk to over there. He um, just, they just launched the Galilee uh, Marathon Swimmers Federation. So they just kind of created that organization to assist with with those swims and those crossings. So um, we, we connected with him uh, a month or so before he went out there and, and he helped us um, line up the observer. I actually found the captain just off somebody's blog, you know, that had done it before and I found the name and I Googled it and emailed this guy, you know, so that's, you know, I think that's that communication has really revolutionized the open water swimming. You can get a hold of people on the other side of the world. Uh, but Guy and his, his group have a you know, just that process set up a lot more now. And I think they were looking to, at a big year this year that kind of got, went sideways with everything else. But, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, not an easy, not a hard place to travel to. Like the, the travel wasn't that, that difficult to get over there and just, just such a really cool part of the world. Yeah, yeah. Is there a documentary film, a book uh, <laughs> in your plans? Because I mean, your, 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 your experiences are so varied. Yeah, um, I, I like writing. I actually um, wrote a book uh, in 2007 on just more about kids and sports called Joe's Rules, How Every Parent Can Help Their Child Excel in Life Through Sports. And I was really, as I continued to explain my philosophy over and over, people about swimming and kids sports, I just started writing and, and that's what I came up with. Um, you know, I just I haven't written enough about my swims. I, I kind of need to um, just... Uh, you know, just to help me kind of reprocess and think through stuff. I just need a little bit of time to knock some of that out. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if it's a book or, or maybe a blog or something, but we'd like to document that a little bit and, and put it out there. If nothing else that just is a resource. I mean, I know it's been really helpful for me, not so much like the popular swims that you can find out about anywhere, but to hear what what is Loch Ness really like and what is yeah. it really like at the Sea of Galilee or how is swimming, you know, the, some of these stage swims and that over, you know, that next day and how are the stages the same and how are they different? Um, questions that, you know, I've got some insight into and I'm having done them before, but, um, you know, being able to share that and, and kind of build the body of knowledge in the open water swimming community, really like to be a part of that. 
Yeah, that's great. I mean, Joe, you're a, you're a very inspirational guy and obviously Swim Neptune wouldn't be as uh, successful without you. So we wish you all the best in the world and we'll, we'll continue to follow you. Sounds good. Appreciate Thank it. You. Good to talk to you today.